Constellation's final episode did exactly what everyone was hoping for, confused the heck out of things even more. No, God, please, no, 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 no! I mean, there are some kooky things brewing, weird theories we have, our reaction and review of this first season, along with some thoughts of what a potential season two may have in store for Constellation viewers like you, so strap in. Kicking things off, this episode is all about The Shining. Yes, Stephen King's famous novel, but more specifically Stanley Kubrick's 1980 screen adaptation, as this finale episode features some haunting music similarly to the movie. <laughs> Along with a winding road, an ominous building in the middle of nowhere, which seems to be haunted by unexplainable things, creepy twins being one of them, a man maniacally swinging an axe, amongst other things. So, uh, yeah, uh, the, the, the more you know. Anyway, Joe is rushed off to Irina's secret secluded medical facility, something we had theorized last week, and learned that this is the Belitz Sanitarium, recognized by the Red Army Memorial statue outside. Now, in our world, this is currently abandoned, essentially a ghost town, with an odd history. For example, Adolf Hitler actually stayed and recovered here at one time. Whereas in the lore of the show, aka the Blue Universe, it appears that the buildings were never fully abandoned. The architecture is surprisingly coincidental because I saw these circle windows symbolizing the two different universes at play, and the middle being the liminal state we witnessed with the cabin. Things happen fairly quickly in this opening, and I personally think the stress of Joe undergoing these mysterious procedures, combined with the anger of Bud smashing the cow, allowed the liminal space to thin and a potential shift happened once again. For example, the freaking alive Joe with half a face at the end of this episode. So let's just jump right into this. The ending shows the Joe that was left up in space with what looks like a damn bear clawed half of her face off. The interesting thing is this might be the blue universe actually. Yes, we know the red and blue Joes switched initially, but the iPad image shows Joe and Alice wearing a blue sweater, something that we concluded back in episode one to be the blue universe. I also chalk this up as this Joe is the one who helped both Paul and Joe with the ISS escape pod clamps. So if this scarred Joe is in fact in the blue universe, that means that there are two Joes now, one on Earth and the other up in space. How this affects season two is beyond me, because what about food, supplies, oxygen? There needs to be a rescue mission, so I'm saying she'll set off a distress beacon and all hell will break loose when they discover who is still on board of the ISS. Reeling things back, the reason the switch happened is because of the stress, anger, and heightened emotion I mentioned earlier. Yes, the Cal device played with the concept of observer's effect, but I'm saying that that's how characters are initially brought into the fold, like Henry, Irina, Joe, Paul, Alice, and now I believe Magnus is in this mix because he saw the other universe Joe on the frozen lake back in episode 7. So that's how the characters are roped into the mix, but then their emotions cause the liminal state to thin and things can switch back. For example, Henry pulling the trigger and going into the burning cabin at the exact same time is what caused him to switch, whereas Joe's experiments in the opening of this episode caused the Joe in space to partially switch along with the Joe in the facility, causing loss of sight in the eye that otherwise was mangled in the other universe. Bud smashing the cow obviously wasn't a help either, clearly breaking the fabric between the two symbolized by the cassette tape disintegrating. Once settled into the facility, two big things are revealed. First is that the fact that this is the same facility Irina and the space programs have been sending former astronauts who are suffering from quote burnout or rather the madness Irina referred to it as. For example, the old man upstairs that seemingly is living with his twin. 
Much like previous episodes, the showrunners are playing with real aspects related to space travel and twisting them because this old man is supposed to be the first man in space, the Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin. In real life, there were some conspiracies around his untimely death, with multiple documents having been declassified over the past decades only to muddy the waters more. So the fact that the show is playing with these real life conspiracies and claiming that Yuri is in fact still alive and locked in this mental facility is a creative way of pulling things in. Now the second is the fact that Joe is pregnant. Remember her and Magnus went to pound town downtown back in episode three? Uh, yeah, she's uh, pregnant with someone not from her universe. Remember, this is Red Joe living in the blue universe. So does that mean that their baby is going to be like from the purple universe, aka the liminal state? Quite possibly because her ultrasound gives the same liminal state reading as the Cal device does in episode two. Is Joe going to have twins, a baby that can switch realities at will? And how the heck did they get an ultrasound reading at only four weeks when it is said five weeks is the earliest it can be done? These are the questions. The final bit with Joe is her and Alice coming to amends that they both need an Alice and a mama. So let's put aside our differences and be those for one another. This concept is very much hinted by both the title of this episode and the song Joe plays and sings via the piano. First of which is the title, These Fragments I Have Shored Against My Ruin, which comes from a 1922 T.S. Eliot poem called The Wasteland. In the context of this poem, the speaker is attempting to offset his own ruin by supporting the quote fragments that remain, preserving them against further decay. Whereas here, it's Joe and Alice coming to agreement that yes, our lives, realities, universes are a bit fragmented, but let's make the best out of this situation, witnessed with their conversation at the end of this episode. Adding to this is the song Joe sings and plays I had just mentioned, being the Swedish folk song Trollmars Vangasang roughly translating to Mother Troll's Song, where the troll keeps her baby safe and warm. But this has a deeper meaning in the context of this series, tying back to the concept of changelings. Obviously, the painting of the changelings, uh, you know, come to mind. But the story of the changeling is a troll replacing a child with an imposter. So Joe singing the song shows she is the troll having taken the Alice that isn't hers. It's a it's a subtle but deep metaphorical piece to show Joe's kind of internal feelings. Magnus and Alice pretty much have similar conversations with one another and Joe, with Magnus coming to the same conclusion as Alice. This isn't my Joe, but you know what? I don't care. She's got a banging bod, maybe some different kinks. We're having a child together. What could go wrong? The one thing that did throw me off was the mirrored therapist appointment. Obviously, there, there are not two magni in the same universe, but rather it was showing that the same thing can happen in two different universes, but the details of each being a smidge different. Each Magnus is scared, emotional, unsure of the future, but in different context or manners. Also, the subtle use of the music is, is it's been brilliant in this show, and I, I hate that I haven't mentioned it, but with the song The Other Half of Me beginning to play as this scene between the two Magnuses ends, and it leads right into the Bud and Henry storylines. Henry and Bud switched universes like we had mentioned last week, and it is very much a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde situation where Henry, aka seemingly the good guy, is having to answer for all of the crimes and atrocities Bud, aka the bad guy, committed. Personally, I thought Henry had it all figured out when he claimed that his DNA spun the other way, like an Australian toilet, but nope, sorry buddy, he is going to fry for Bud. So leading into season two, I'm curious if Henry is going to discover a way to switch again. Maybe he makes a prison style Cal device out of shivs in his toilet. I don't know, maybe it could happen. On the other hand, Bud has something sinister up his sleeve. He destroyed the Cal, which doesn't seem, he doesn't seem too bothered by it and reveals to Irina that he is no longer Henry, but rather a different version of him. 
so he's clearly not being secretive about it, and honestly, maybe he, he just wants to live a lavish, worry-free lifestyle rather than being a drunk in a one-bedroom apartment. I mean, maybe. But I really think that he has more to his plan than he's leading on. Because visiting Ian Rogers, who is alive in this universe, was a choice. Which in of itself is interesting because it's a Jack the Ripper spooky tour talking about the famous double event evening where Jack the Ripper strikes twice and wasn't caught. Much like Bud killing Ian and the attempt on Paul and then disappearing into the night, putting the blame on Henry. Again, clever writing and symbolism here, even with Ian Rogers recounting the events of Jack the Ripper that evening, and then Bud almost reenacts them in the specific alleyway that he's talking. A small thing did jump out to me when Bud was talking with Irina, though. She casually mentions St. Sergius, which I'm assuming is the secret facility where Joe is at. But when looking into the history, St. Sergius was the patron saint of Russia, of which Irina and Ilya, both Russian, are in charge of the facility, but St. Sergius was usually accompanied by another soldier, Bacchius, and the pair died as martyrs. Now, I think the series is taking more of a science approach than religion, even though there, you know, was the wounded angel painting, the changeling could be looked at as a demon or devil, and there is this painting or picture behind Irina that translates to there is no god. Anyway, this is a long-winded way of saying Sergius and Bacchius could be metaphorical versions of Henry and Bud, where they must both perish for all of this to be broken. Paul is an interesting case going into season two because we know there was a change with uh, Henry and Bud, but at the end of this episode, funky things are happening with Joe. Well, I'm saying that this Paul that wakes up is actually the Paul from the blue universe that died. Yes, I, I know the rules and logistically, I, I don't even know how this works at this point, but when Paul springs awake, um, it, first off, it's a clever use of the thermometer to mirror Bud's gun, but with Paul looking at his left arm first, the same one that was lost aboard the ISS, then looking at both as a, what the f*** am I doing alive right now look. Now crazy out there theory, but yeah, I have a feeling that this Paul is the one that lost his arm aboard the ISS accident, and if I am right, this opens up a whole can of worms of what is actually possible in this world, so let me know in the comments what your thoughts are on Paul. Did he switch just like Henry and Bud? Because I am saying 100% that's what just happened. Lastly, there is Irina, who uh, we mentioned was in charge of the secret facility, and through assumptions, is the one who knows the most about this astronaut burnout disease. Up until this point, it's safe to assume that she was, she kind of had like a nefarious side to her, keeping the facility under wraps. But the ending of this, with her sending the email to former astronauts, has me thinking she's not only going to gather information to help stop the universal shifts, but also find a way to switch Henry and Bud back. There's just something from the dinner meeting that makes me think that she didn't like the tone of this new Bud, and with her suffering from cancer, she kinda doesn't have anything to lose. I think it's why the Valia, which is Irina by the way, mentioned last week that she wants to help Alice too. So if season two may be Irina venturing out to former astronauts, learning that their lives are just as backwards as everyone else's. Oh, and fun fact, the emails listed are actually the names of production and crew who worked on this series. So again, the, 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 the more you know. There are a lot of crazy theories out there. I'm pretty certain the Observer's effect is how characters are brought into the mix, and the heightened emotions are the key to switching, or at least witnessing the liminal state between universes. But I think time may play a part in all of this too. Now take this with a grain of salt, it, it could solely be editing errors, but I have a feeling the universes are either jumping in time or happening at different moments in time. So if you remember back to episode one, the time dilation between space and Earth is casually mentioned to be 0. .0007 seconds after six months. So this idea is present at least. Well, in some of the episodes, time time is off. Easy. That's the easiest way to say it. For example, in episode six, when Paul shows up to Bud's, 
The clock in his car is 2254, but when Bud shoots Paul, which should be minutes later, the time on his phone is 2106, meaning a difference of an hour and 48 minutes of when Paul shows up versus when he is shot. And I'm pretty sure that there are time discrepancies on the ISS as well, but the even weirder thing is that episodes one feature two dates of 2021 and 2023. The ISS incident is supposed to have happened in 2021, but yet a display in what's supposed to be the blue universe claims it's 2023. On top of that, everything is supposed to have happened on Saturday, October 14th, but if we look at the date on Irina's iPad as she receives Joe's email, it does claim it's Saturday the 14th, but the 14th of October falls on a Saturday happening in 2023 rather than 2021. The Comic-Con happens in 2021 as well, so is there a huge time issue we haven't even accounted for, or is this solely an editing mistake? Because time on top of quantum mechanics seems like a lot, but I wouldn't put it past the showrunners, so let me know, in, let me know your thoughts on this time issue in the comments. Overall, Constellation was a thought-provoking, trippy-as-hell series. At first, I thought most of what I was watching was just a bunch of random sci-fi mumbo jumbo, but when looking at the scientific ideas that are carefully weaved into the story while subtly hinting at multiple universe theories for those paying way too close of attention was expertly done. Personally, I do feel like there were some sequences that were doubled up and felt like we were being spoon-fed things already established episodes prior, so that's, that's definitely a bugaboo for me along with the structure of how the story was told. Like, episode 7 100% needs to happen to understand what's at play, but it is messy. It, it's a messy episode to get through. Aside from that, everything else really worked for me. Sure, there's some cringy acting a time or two with some characters, but I really feel like the core cast hit the emotional beats, ramped up the feeling of paranoia, specifically Numi Rapace as Joe, essentially playing two characters on top of the twins that portrayed Alice. I'd give uh, the first season of Constellation a solid 7 out of 10. It 100% scratched the sci-fi thriller itch, and week to week there were also interesting concepts and ideas to dive into. Hell, Jonathan Banks as Henry and Bud was basically the cherry on top of this, J Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So I'm curious how they will tackle some of the big outstanding questions like, what the heck is going on with Space Joe? How is Joe's pregnancy going to unfold? Are Henry and Bud going to switch before it's too late? What universe is this Paul actually from? And what information is Irina trying to gather? I'll definitely be tuning in for a season two solely for these answers alone. That is everything for Constellation Season 1. I, I may put out a video in the next couple days about what needs to be covered in a potential Season 2, so stick around for that, and please let me know in the comments what you think of this show, what did you like, what did you not like, what sort of theories you have, and what you'd like to see explored in a Season 2, because there is a lot, so drop anything and everything in the comments below. Thank you again to everyone who stopped by weekly and watched my breakdowns. It was a fun and stressful journey, so, so just watching really helped the channel. If you want to help out even more, be sure to subscribe for future breakdowns like this, along with following all of my other social media listed on screen and in the description below. Honestly, I post everywhere. I'm sure it's obnoxious, but also it's easy to find me. So thanks again. You've been the bestest. Subscribe. Do it. Yay!